Good evening. Good evening. Yes, this is my LL Bean shirt. <laughs> I had my wife uh, check me for stickers and tags and whatever. Would not be the first time that I've taught a class that afterward I was told, Psst, did you know you have something that's that extra large across your shirt? <laughs> so, that's why I bring Brenda along to kind of uh, keep me straight. Uh, so what we are doing this week and what I mentioned on the first night, uh, probably one of the biggest Bible study things that uh, was a revelation to me and helped me to understand the New Testament better is the understanding that the letters are not just some separate part that fits after the book of Acts. The letters are actually mixed through the book of Acts. And so you can take every letter almost every letter that we have from the Apostle Paul and draw a line in the book of Acts and say, this is where this was written. If this does happen to be your first night, you've only missed one letter. <laughs> so Paul went on his first missionary journey. He went up through, Paul and Barnabas went through Cyprus, then up through Galatia, came back to Antioch, and they discovered that Peter was there, and Peter was just kind of checking up to make sure things were working okay, and he said it's all cool. He ate with the Gentiles. Then some representatives from Jerusalem came up, but we find out from this letter that these were not really coming to you from the Jerusalem church, but they came as if they were. And so Peter was kind of intimidated by these, and he pulled back and wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore, which got Paul furious. And Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians, and it's a very, very frustrated letter. And when you read the book of Galatians, understanding that, you're just constantly understanding just kind of this edge that Paul constantly has in this book, this frustration that just barely under the the edge of the book, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Uh, and then Paul Barnabas and several other representatives were sent down to Jerusalem to get an official word from the church down there. James, the brother of Jesus, who church tradition would later bring out that they called him old camel knees because he spent so much time in his knees praying. He was the leader of the Jerusalem church, and it says in the book of Acts that there was much disputing back and forth, and finally Peter, who was the one that Paul just confronted, came back and said, you know what? He's right. The Spirit came to me in a vision and said, what I have called clean, don't you call unclean. We need to not call the Gentiles unclean. And so the church wrote this letter and all the requirements they put on the church of the Gentiles was that you abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols. And we, I think, are probably going to talk about that later today. And from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality, if you keep yourselves from these, you'll do well. And they sent them back with Paul and Barnabas. And again, I had talked to you about the careful language of the apostle uh, of Luke. And Luke puts Barnabas in front of Paul because this is the way the letter was written. It's the Jerusalem church who is thinking of Barnabas as still being the leader of this group. So they said Barnabas and Paul. And they sent along Judas and Silas as backup. So they traveled this this party of Paul, Barnabas, Saul, and Judas, uh, uh, Silas and Judas, along with whoever else they had sent down, made the 300-mile journey up to Antioch. And the Antioch church got together and said, you know what, we really need to uh, send that letter out to the baby churches to know what's going on. Paul and Barnabas got into a fight, dispute. I'm not even going to call it a fight, into a dispute about John Mark, because Barnabas, who's the word Barnabas, anytime you see the word Bar in front of a name in the New Testament, it means son of. And so the name Barnabas 
means son of consolation. One of the more interesting, and this is just a little bit of a side trip here, one of the more interesting ones of those, remember the man who was going to be crucified instead of Jesus, who was Barabbas. Okay, using your new Greek here, what does his name mean? Son of? What's Abba? Father. Hmm. There is a long tradition. Now, the word, the name Jesus was actually a common name back then. And they are thinking that Herod actually was playing a game. And he said, do you want this Jesus or this Jesus? That Barabbas' name was actually Jesus. And so he's playing a game, saying, so which Jesus do you want? Do you want Jesus the criminal? Or do you want Jesus who said he's the Messiah? Which one do you want? So when they wrote the Gospels, they found that confusing to people. And so they put Barabbas in, son of the father. So that's a kind of man Barnabas, Barnabas was. Barnabas was... Uh, this uh, very, very loving person. He was the one that it, when Paul came to Jerusalem and everybody else rejected him, Barnabas took him in. And so when he came to John Mark, he also took in John Mark, even to the point of splitting with the Apostle Paul. And they decided, okay, we're going to go down to Cyprus. So Paul decided, well then, if that's the case, I'm going to go up through here. And so Paul picked Silas, and Paul and Silas went up through Paul's old territory in Tarsus, and up through Derby, and they went from town to town delivering the decision. They delivered copies of the, that letter, and he came to Derby and Lystra, and we talked about this yesterday, he picked up Timothy and circumcised him, which is really peculiar because we're handing out letters saying you don't have to be circumcised, and we circumcise Timothy. But the whole reason was to not offend those around. We need to be careful about that. You know, say people that are going into a mission field in uh, another country, not to offend the people that are there. That, you know, for example, you may be in an area where women who do not have dresses down to their ankles are offensive. So women wear dresses down to your ankles to not offend the people so that they don't miss the gospel for the freedom that you have in yourself. These quotes from yesterday, F.F. Bruce says, truly emaciated souls are not bondage to that emaciation. In other words, if we are truly free, somebody says, you know, I'm really offended by that, and I say, fine, then I'm, you know, I'm not going to offend you. But there are times when you need to decide who to offend. Uh, there's just going to be times when if I do this, I'm going to offend a young person. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to offend an elder. I've gotten myself in trouble on occasion from this statement, but I will say it again. If I have to decide on whether to offend an elder or whether to offend the, offend the young people, I'll offend the elder. Reason being, we are not supposed to offend who? The weaker brother. So if I offend one of these young men, there is a chance that they could walk away from the faith. And if I offend an elder, They'll be mad at me. They may not invite me back to church again. But they'll be okay, and I'll be okay. And that happens on occasion. There was a time, and I'm not sure if this is a valid uh, explanation or not. This was Christmas a number of years ago when we had a girl that had lived in our house and she had a girlfriend. So she has a lesbian girlfriend. And when she brought that to me, I said, that gives me somebody else to love. And she called me one night. I was milking. And she said, uh, hey, Dad, what are you doing? 
and it said, I am milking. She said, what are you doing after milking? And I said, well, I have to teach Sunday school tomorrow morning. It is the Christmas sermon, uh, you know, Christmas lesson. I need to be back to teach Sunday school. And she said, can we, Angie just walked away from a drug rehab. Is there a chance we can pick her up? And I said, I'll finish milking. We'll just see how it works out. If I can get back by nine o'clock, it's all cool. And so I raced through milking. I ran in, took a shower, put on church clothes. And uh, I ran into Lancaster, picked up Amber, and I said, so where's Aunt? And she said, I don't know. So we're in the car, and a pickup truck actually, and she texted her and said, and actually she called. She said, hey, Ange, where are you? And she said, oh. Now, meantime, when I'm going in the way to, love, to Lancaster, I prayed. I said, God, I'm going to put this as a round trip in my GPS. And if I am back by 9 o'clock, according to the GPS, I know it's your plan. So Amber is on the phone saying, where are you? And she said, oh. And she looked at me and said, she's in Elmira, New York. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. And, and Amber said, no, Dad said, right, just give me a minute. So I, you know, plugged it in, you know, address Elmira, New York, address back home again. I looked at my GPS and started to laugh. I need to be back by 9 o'clock. I said before 9 o'clock. Any guesses as to what my GPS said? <laughs> 8.59. <laughs> And I said, we're doing this. And now I had plans all along that if I am taking somebody, you know, going without sleep, these kids are going to church with me. So I pick up Amber and Amber's got, you know, purple and green and orange hair and she's got a nose ring and earrings, but yeah, she's dressed okay. Got up to New York and picked up Ange and looked at Ange and Ange has short black hair and nose ring tattoos, but she also, is dressed reasonably. I got her, you know, we're like five miles away from the church. And Amber looked at me and said, so where are we going? I said, we are going to church. She said, the hell we are. <laughs> so we got off, we got to the church, and we actually made it back 10 minutes early. And the reason we made it back 10 minutes early is so those kids could smoke cigarettes and swear at me in the church parking lot. And all of God's saints are coming in watching these two kids swearing at me and smoking cigarettes and yelling at me. Finally, I got them into the church. I went into the women's room, and uh, they weren't coming out. Sam Castle's Miriam came out of the bathroom, and I said, are there a couple of my girls in there? And Miriam said, there's a couple really tough-looking girls in there. I said, that's them. I got them. I sent my sister in. She chased them out. And we went up in the balcony where my class was, which is about as wide open as you can have a, a class up there. And I gave the lesson I had pre-planned. It was about Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. And I said, as I've told you guys a number of times so far, I'm a picture person, and I know in my head what every person in the Bible looked like, because I've got this picture in my head. So I want you to put in your mind a picture of Mary the mother of Jesus. Assemble here in your mind what Mary looked like. What if I were to tell you that Mary was overweight and had a skin complexion problem and just had this uh, hair issue that she could never quite get over? And she spoke with a little bit of a, a stutter. And my answer is, why not? Why do we need to pick the perfect? Because aren't we told that those are the ones that God does not choose? And that was the theme of my lesson that morning. And the next, and I tend to be a little bit non-tactical about some of these things, tactful with some of these things. The next time I taught that class, I opened up by saying, I'm not sure if any of you were offended by the two girls I had in the class last time. And I said, and if you were, I don't care. I said, that's what the church is about. There are times when we simply need to decide what is important 
and who we offend. So, Paul and Silas went up through. They went to Derby, to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, which was the four churches that were that they had planted in Galatia. And then they said, "Now what?" And so, Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Silas, may have talked it over, and they said, "Let's go to Ephesus. Let's head across Asia." And they went, tried to go across there. And the Holy Spirit said no. And so instead they tried to go to Bithynia. When they had opposite, come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of the Lord of Jesus did not allow them. And I think it's quite possible because Peter worked there. Did any of you figure out yet that you can't do everything? I'm kind of still working in that sometimes. <laughs> Where, you know, every once in a while I have to bite my tongue and say, that's not my job. Just back off, that's somebody else's job. Just let them do it. And that's what God, I think, told Paul. Paul, that's, that's, that's Peter's territory. Just back off, don't go there. And so they just kept on walking until they got to Troas and had their toes dangling in the water at Troas. And they got down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man in Macedonia standing there, and I talked about this last night, that I am convinced that that particular vision was actually of Luke, the writer of the book of Acts. Because we see a change here. Luke, the very careful writer, said they had come up to Mysia, and they attempted to go to Bithynia. Spirit wouldn't allow them, so they went down to Troas, and a vision came, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, for God had called us. So that was where Luke joined them. And I forget if I actually have it in my slides, but we see after they left Philippi, Luke was no longer with them. Now, we start new territory. Philippi. This is uh, the prison of St. Paul, apparently, according to uh, somebody's tradition. Philippi was a Roman colony which became known as a retirement area for Roman soldiers. Rome rewarded or punished cities based on who they side with when they invaded. We kind of see this with, uh, with, the Ro with the Romans, with the Russians right now with uh, some of their attacks as they're saying, you know, you welcome us in, we will, you know, be good to you. If you don't, we'll bomb you to the ground. And so Philippi sided with Rome and was rewarded by colony status by Augustus Caesar. Corinth fought against Rome and was flattened and was later rebuilt because it was an important city. But Philippi, and we're going to see when we look at the book of Philippians tomorrow, that there's a lot of military terms in Philippi, in, in the book of Philippians, because that's the stuff they understood. <laughs> if I drop over in the next one, you know that they're really the real bullets. <laughs> now, one of the things that I have not, don't have in these slides, but to me, is a big picture of what happens when they walked into Philippi. Remember that Paul always went to the synagogue. And he got to Philippi, and there wasn't a synagogue. I don't know. I, maybe I'm human. I don't know. But I, I like having crowds of people. I like having people want to hear me. And I, I, I say that honestly and brutally. You know, if, if I come in and discover that, you know, last night there were 50 people and tonight there's 10 people, it doesn't matter what activities are going on, I'm just assuming I offended somebody and they don't want to be here. And we think of the Apostle Paul, and we just have this vision of crowds of people. Think about Philippi. What the... Paul go to see in Philippi. Remember, 
that he had a vision saying, come to Macedonia. And he is following a vision. I didn't have a vision to come to Bible school in Maine. I wasn't sleeping in bed, and all of a sudden this vision came up and said, come up to Maine, we need you. I got a text saying, are you willing? And I checked my schedule and said, I am willing. Actually, most of God's work in this, I think, was that uh, he gave uh, Ashley and Kenny a baby so we could come up and see the baby. Uh, but, so Paul has this vision to go to Macedonia. He goes to Philippi. They don't have any synagogues. There apparently is not a single synagogue in Philippi because a synagogue takes 10 adult men to establish a synagogue. There were not 10 adult Jews in Philippi. So where did Paul go? He went to women's Bible study. I just have this image of the Apostle Paul with half a dozen women sitting around the, the, the river. And he's talking to these women and saying, ladies, do you understand the stuff you've been studying? And what are they studying? They're, they're studying Old Testament. They're studying, you know, Isaiah. They're studying, you know, the prophets. And Paul is sitting down saying, I bring to you the fulfillment of the prophets you saw. Wouldn't it be easy to just walk away? Wouldn't it just be easy to walk into Philippi and look around and say, yeah, ha, it's not worth it. Paul went into Philippi, and Philippi became his most upholding church. It became the church that was the strongest of his church. When we get to Philippians, I'm not sure if any of you, you know, if I ask what, what's your favorite epistle? Mine's Philippians. I love Philippians. I love Philippians because I love Paul's attitude in Philippians. One of my favorite, as you go through Philippians, you go through and you find out that the Apostle Paul who was in prison. So, so what if soldiers were to come tonight and say, I got really bad news, Putin won, Biden lost, and you're all going to jail. So what would be your attitude sitting in jail? The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians is sitting there saying, I am here with a guard chained on each arm. All right, so you are chained with a guard on each arm. Well, what's your opinion? What, what, what's your thought? Your thought is I have a guard chained in my arm and I can't go anywhere. Paul says, I have a guard chained on each arm and they can't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and like about... Three or four times a day, they change guards. And he says, have I told you about Jesus? <laughs> and at the end of the book of Philippians, he is giving greetings. And he says, they of the Praetorian Guard give your greetings. Where did they become Christians? Because they are chained to this idiot <laughs> in Rome. But that's the book of Philippians. Had Paul not gone down the women's Bible study, the Philippian church would never have, ex have existed. What role are you playing? You're obviously not ch teaching a children's class tonight, or you wouldn't be here. I'm glad you're not all teaching children's classes tonight. But there are people out here and in there teaching Jesus to little kids that you have to snag to keep from running up in the stage. <laughs> Not that anybody would actually run on the stage, understand, but you know, just in case. We had a girl who, when she was little, her mom was an alcoholic and would uh, send her on, the, on, the church, on, on a church school bus to Sunday school. And somebody told this little girl about Jesus for the first time. And we have what we call Bible to school, where kids can get out of like uh, 
second, third, fourth grade, I'm not sure what it is, to go learn about the Bible, and she hated school, so she took that, and somebody else talked to her about Jesus. And one of the church's pastor's daughters took her under her arm and took her to youth activities. And then she started going to Bible studies. And one of our girls went to a Bible study with her. And she wound up in the hospital. The, the, this girl wound up in the hospital with psychiatric issues. And I was called in to, to talk to her. She wound up living with us. Somewhere in the process, I wound up going to pick her up. And a woman came out of the door of the house and said, I just wanted to see what an answer to prayer looked like. She had a group of people praying for her. Today, that young lady attends church, studies the Bible. She'll, she'll call me randomly and say, you know, she is in the middle of something or the other. And, you know, I can't even give you an example, but these deep esoteric things from deep down in. And she has a little girl, not her daughter, that lives with her, that she takes to church with her and proclaims Jesus. Now, let me ask you, who was responsible for this young lady coming to Christ? Everybody. It is not something that you can notch, another notch in your gun and say, I got that one. You do what you do. Whatever God puts in front of you. Paul got to Philippi, saw a women's Bible study, and he spoke at a women's Bible study and founded one of the strongest churches. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. Lydia, you go back and study Lydia, and I have a, a study for them. Sometime I'll have to come back and, and do some of the women in Paul's life. Lydia was a strong woman that, uh, you know, Paul hated to take from other people because he didn't want to feel obligated. And so when they went into Philippi, it basically said, you know, Lydia compelled us to come to her house. Okay then, you know, if you don't leave me any other options, but go to your house. So they left prison, visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So again, Luke stays back in Philippi. Paul and Silas in Thessalonica, Departed Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. That's not supposed to be. That's part of the uh, description. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Uh, there is a road, an ancient road called the Ignatian Way, and I've seen, I've, I saw a Facebook post recently that says something like, uh, "The Ignatian Way, two thousand years later, you know, my back street, a month after being paved." So this is like a 2,000-year-old road that crossed, and I don't even have the ends of it, but crossed the whole way across here. But it goes through Philippi, it mentions Amphilopolis, it comes across to Thessalonica. And then they follow it, uh, <coughs> Philippi, actually Berea's down in here then. Uh, they, they leave it for Berea. Thessalonica. It was a 90-mile trip from Philippi to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was founded by Cassander, king of Macedonia, in 315 BC. It was built as a new city. So I've often been in some of the old cities, you know, the ones that just kind of grew up like mushrooms, and the streets just kind of wander all over the place, kind of wherever the donkeys happen to leave a trail. Mas uh, Thessalonica was built as a new city, so it was laid out with neat grid lines and the whole deal and forcibly populated. <laughs> so that's where the soldiers come along and say, we built a city, but we have nobody for our city. So they got them to just start to clear out town, saying, you are living in here now. I was named after his wife, uh, the half-sister of Alexander the Great. It was granted the right to self-rule at the same time as Philippi for supporting August Augustus, Augustus in the Roman Civil War. Although there is the appearance that was very quick, it appears that they must have been there for a while. When you read it in the Bible, and again, the Bible account is often hard to follow because 
you have these long passages and you realize, oh, that's over a period of two weeks. And then you have this and you realize, oh, there's like three or four years covered in there. So there must have been time to preach in the synagogue and get kicked out and then build up a largely Gentile church. And it must have been large enough to require more than one house church. Because Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that you, this letter be read to all of them. So there must be multiple house churches that this letter was to be passed back and forth to. Although beginning in the synagogue, the church of Thessalonica was largely pagan. In 1 verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians, we see for the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So these were not Jews that he was redirecting. These were pagans being turned from idols. The better and high ranking were becoming Christians while the lower class ones were the ones that tended to stick with Judaism or paganism. We see in Acts 17, 4, some of them were persecuted, persuaded, and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So it appeared like the, uh, some of the, the, the more superstitious and the, the lower ranking didn't, and some of the higher ranking did. Acts 17, 5, but the Jews which believed not, the ones that were not persuaded by Paul, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the synagogue. Again, that was the place where Paul always went. That was where he began his base of operations. And it was very troubling to Paul that he was torn away right in the middle of a promising mission. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, that's in 1 Thessalonians, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Again, I, and I've talked about Paul through the week, about just being this energizer bunny, constantly running, constantly running. And look at his intense feelings. You know, where he is torn away from the Thessalonian church who he's starting to see results in. And Paul didn't just say, oh, well, we'll go somewhere else. He said, our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. And so he is trying to go back and his cohorts and, and advisors are saying, don't do it, they'll kill you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. So they tried to go back, and they just said, no, it's not safe. Okay, so they took a 60-mile journey from Thessalonica to Berea. Up until now, they'd followed the Via Ignatia. They left the, the road to shake pursuit, because it's harder to follow if you're going through a back trail somewhere and because he had a goal of going to Corinth. And the Via Ignatia, as we saw on the map, went toward Rome, where the Jews had just been forced out by Claudius. Claudius Caesar had just passed a, a proclamation saying that no Jews were allowed in Rome. And the historians say that it was because there was an uproar caused by one Christus, which is probably Christ. Probably the Jews and the Christians were squabbling back and forth, and Claudius just said, the pox in both your houses, and kicked them all out. Paul founded a small church in Berea that didn't stay long. Now watch what happens here. Okay, so we'll just do this a little bit. This is kind of the way they are. So the Berea is over here, and we're going to watch as Paul heads toward Athens. So we see in Acts 17, 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God is being proclaimed by Paul of Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent off Paul by way of the sea. Now I want you to watch this. They sent Paul off by way to the sea 
But Silas and Timothy remained where? In Berea. Paul was the one that they were after. And so because Paul was the one that they were after, they sent him off to the sea and left Silas and Timothy back. That is something that this is the only time, except for in the book of 2 Timothy where he's about to die, that Paul is alone. Paul does not function well alone. Paul functions with people around him. And we're going to watch and see what happens when Paul is alone. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So what are Silas and Timothy doing anyway? We're going to get into that in a minute. But uh, So Paul is alone, he's down in Athens, and he wasn't even supposed to be doing anything in Athens. In Athens, he was supposed to just be chilling and waiting for Silas and Timothy. One of the things that just blows my mind, and I talked about it, couple times so far this week is how you contact people in that world <laughs> I mean seriously I, I am late getting to the car and my phone chirps and it is Brenda saying where are you I am already at the car sorry I'm talking more likely the other way where I'm texting Brenda saying I fell asleep wake me up when you get to the car How do you know? How do you find somebody? And tomorrow we're going to see this being a huge deal as Paul is hunting for Titus and he can't find him. And so things happen. People get killed. You may have been murdered by bandits. Nobody knows. And so Paul goes to Athens waiting for Silas and Timothy and said, get to me as soon as you can. I'm going to Athens. Approaching Athens would not have been encouraged to the Christian missionaries that passed on the main road. There were four miles of altars. So picture in your mind something four miles away. You know, when we lived in the farm, my thing was always it's a half mile at the end of the block, it's a mile to Pender, and it's five miles to Manheim. So almost the whole way to Manheim, there are altars on both sides of the road the whole way down. Now, Paul is not supposed to be preaching there. He's just chilling, waiting for Silas and Timothy. But he can't help it. And so, he goes up in Mars Hill and begins his sermon. And so, this is the, the, the first Thessalonians version of this story. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we decided to be left alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God and proclaiming the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith. You see where Timothy is? Timothy went to Thessalonica. Paul is telling the Thessalonian church, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to find out what's happening with you. So I sent Timothy and said, even if it means I'm alone in Athens, so be it. I'll just wait. So no one would be shaken by the, these persecutions. Indeed, you yourselves know that this is what we're all destined for. So what's Silas doing? Silas was sent to Philippi. So they, the two underlings were sent back. Timothy was sent to Thessalonica. Silas was sent to Philippi to check up on the church, churches, and find out what they're doing. And this is a very long passage here, and you know it anyway. Uh, now, while Paul was waiting from the Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. And he began to preach. And he uh, went to the synagogue and the devout persons in the marketplace, and some of the scholars said, hey, we'd like to hear you. Uh, and the, they took him to the Areopagus and saying, maybe... We know what this new teaching is you're preaching. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know what these things mean. Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except hearing, telling, or hearing something new. And they laughed in his face. After this, Paul left Athens 
and went to Corinth. And I've mentioned this other than in 2 Timothy, where Paul's in the dungeon waiting death. This period of time is the only time where he's alone. Did he ever get discouraged? Or was Paul in there just saying, yes, I have faith that God will be with me wherever I am? First Corinthians. He's heading to Corinth, remember. And he says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, and I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. This is the Apostle Paul arriving in Corinth alone. He was at Athens alone. They laughed in his face. Silas is in Philippi. Timothy is in Thessalonica. And he is traveling alone, walking into a city where there is a temple on the hill with a thousand prostitutes. He is in a city, as we'll look at in a minute, that is filled with foreign sailors and all of the stuff that foreign sailors do. And he said, I came there in weakness and fear and much trembling. But you know what? He came. You all ever go somewhere in weakness and fear and much trembling? I came tonight not wanting to be here, I'll be honest. My thoughts were not clear for tonight. I just didn't have a good feeling for tonight. But you do it. And you throw yourself down before God and you say, this isn't my thing, this is your thing. And you preach Jesus Christ and him crucified in weakness and fear and much trembling. Isn't that amazing? Here is our lonely preacher arriving in Corinth, and there's Aquila. <laughs> A native of Pontus, who had recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to, re to leave Rome. And Paul went to see them. I think that is the coolest thing in the world where God, who is looking into the future, says, you know what? Paul is going to be in Corinth alone, so I'm going to see that there is somebody waiting for him. And it's going to take an emperor's orders to get them there, and so be it. Corinth. Corinth is an, an interesting city, just in general principles. And I have didn't I, I show you the bigger picture here, but uh, Corinth is located right here. It's kind of like uh, our North and South America where there's this isthmus in between and everybody looked down and said there should be a canal through there. And so this is where Corinth is located, right in that little skinny area. And this is very stormy waters out here. So the small ships that they took back down there, this is a an extremely dangerous territory to go, say between Ephesus and Rome. And so Corinth was the place where, let's see, I gotta, but let, let's go up, go back to that one. Corinth was a pagan city, and at the time you called somebody a Corinthian, was to accuse them of being sexually loose. Yeah, Corinthian, and yeah, that's what you call your daughter if she wasn't dressing quite right. Because that was just the worldwide reputation. It sat in a narrow neck of land by the Aegean Sea where there was a slideway dating back 600 years built to drag ships across the other side on the way to and from Italy. You had the option of dragging the ship four miles or sailing 200 miles in dangerous seas. In the time of Paul Corinth, had become the ultimate seaport where sailors spent their time while their boats were being dragged to the other side. The Temple of Aphrodite was based out of a thousand prostitutes. The dragway is still visible today. So this uh, thousand, the 2,000 year old dragway since it was last used, or 1,500 years at least since it was used. And the interesting thing is that 
they said that the, they used carts, and there was a notch on the one side, and they can't figure out what the notch was from. I want to say, duh. They had carts, and they ran one wheel in this gutter to keep it online. And they would drag those things back and forth, either by slaves or by oxen or something else. But they would drag them across there. Today, there is a canal through there. And that's actually used mostly for tourists now because the huge ships can't make it through. But uh, that is what made Corinth Corinth. Here is the uh, a satellite map of it. You can see the canal through there and the dragway just kind of ran parallel to that. Corinth was Paul's first base of operations, but it wasn't intended to be such. Paul wasn't intending to stay there. He wanted to return to Thessalonica, but he received a vision. Acts 18.9. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silenced. For I am with you and will lay, no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, for there are many in this city who are my people. Isn't that an interesting phrase? They had not heard of Jesus, but they were his people. There are people out there that are his people, and they have not heard of Jesus yet. And maybe you are the one who are to give that message. God said to Paul, there are many in this city who are my people, and you are the one who is going to deliver the message to let them know that they're my people. And he stayed there a year and six months preaching God. And because he was in the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, that's Priscilla and Aquila, for they were tent makers by trade. And early on, he did something he rarely did. He did his own baptizing. Why? Because he was alone. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia, and that I have devoted... Have, they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. So no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't whether I baptized anybody else. And again, that's a pre-word processor. As Paul is running through, his head, oh, Stephanus, forget about Stephanus. But this is the section of 1 Corinthians where he's talking about uh, the factions that have built up in the church. And that's where he's saying, I am glad that I didn't baptize people. Because then people say, well, I was baptized by Paul. Who were you baptized by? And he said, there's only three people that I baptized. And the reason he baptized them is that there was nobody else there. There was nobody else to do it. So, Paul and Bar uh, Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, from Philippi, and from Thessalonica. And it says in... 18.5, he said, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. What was he doing before? He was tent making and preaching. Because you see, Silas came back from Philippi with money, so Paul didn't need to work. Philippians 4.15, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, and I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. And so the church sent money back with Silas. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 to 9. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So Paul was getting money from Philippi to do the preaching in Thessalonica. Well, what about Timothy? Timothy came back from Thessalonica with questions. Now remember, we've got two different individuals here too. Silas is a veteran leader. Timothy is this fragile guy that Paul is constantly saying, build up Timothy, be nice to Timothy, don't beat down Timothy. And so the Thessalonians are asking Timothy questions, and Timothy says, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And so he came down with questions. Uh, 
Timothy got called with questions especially concerning the future, which seemed to be a particularly vexing problem in Thessalonica, causing someone to go up the deep end, even reaching the point that some just stopped working and were staring at the sky, waiting for Jesus to come. I've had kids like that already, right? They're, <laughs> they're out there reading a book and hoping Jesus comes before the dishes need washed. Uh, and so Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. And so 1 Thessalonians was sent back with Timothy. The greeting is from the three of them. Silas disappears from the scene at this point. We don't see him again. And 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, it says Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonica. And he says up here, but Timothy has just now come to us from you. So he got the questions, turned around, and answered the questions. He brought us good news of your faith and love. He's also told us that you always remember us kindly. He mentioned the jail incident. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. So he mentions the, the jail incident in Philippi. As typical with the earlier epistles, uh, 1 Thessalonians was written to address a specific problem. Galatia had trouble with legalism. Thessalonica had trouble with prophecy. Unlike churches like Corinth and Ephesus, Paul was only in town for a short period of time, so he wasn't able to drill down real deep and get a lot of stuff taught to them. Among the problems in the Thessalonian church faced was persecution by pagans. Uh, 2.14, for you brothers became, became imitators of the churches of God and Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. So they are suffering physical persecution. They are suffering a temptation to accept the sexual practices of those that are around. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. One of the biggest issues, though, was prophecy, going overboard in prophecy. Some of the Christians had given up working, and they'd relied on others to supply, supply their needs. But we urge you brothers to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. There was uncertainty about those that died and you know, what's going to happen to them. Uh, but we don't want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. There seems to have been some ulterior motive, accusations of ulterior motives by Paul because he's getting money from the Philippian church. Uh, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. The letter finished with some proverbs from Paul. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil etc. and down through. So Timothy packed that letter up, took it up to the Philippians, and he came back with more questions. And especially there seemed to have a little bit of a problem. And there's a little, like Galatians, a little bit of an edge to 2 Thessalonians. If you read 2 Thessalonians, you can tell that some of the stuff is a repeat of 1 Thessalonians, but just a little more edgy. Uh, the and apparently someone had come in the meantime and claimed to have a word from Paul. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. So somebody was up there trying to claim they're from Paul. And again, Paul's a little irritated with this. And he finishes up the letter by saying, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is a sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It's the way I write. So if somebody sends you a letter and it doesn't have my signature at the end, then it's not right. Paul repeats a lot of the same things he said in the first letter using stronger language. 
uh, in 1 Thessalonians, he says, for that indeed is what you're to be doing to all the brothers from Macedonia, etc. In 2 Thessalonians, he said, now we keep, command you brothers in the name of our Lord to keep away from a brother who's walking in idleness in accord to the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, etc. And that's where we get down to this. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So he tells some of the same stuff he said in 1 Thessalonians, but stronger. Uh, in each of the previous places where there were promised, Paul was always driven out, often with the approval of the authorities in Pisidian Antioch, Lystra, Derby, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens. In Philippi, they were accused of disturbing the peace. In Thessalonica, they were accused of setting up a competing Caesar. In Corinth, they accused Paul of pushing a religion that was not officially approved by Rome. They said this man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. And Gallio, who, by the way, that I don't have it in my notes, but this is one way that the historians take the time, and they put the time precisely because Gallio was the procurator for one year. And so you'd say, exactly, that's when he was in. And Gallio said, this is a matter of questions of your religion. Just go somewhere else. And interestingly, Paul, when he went to Corinth, he led the leader of the synagogue to Christ. And they seized Sosthenes and beat him. He's the, now the ruler of the synagogue. And later, Paul gives greetings from Sosthenes. So Sosthenes came, went on to become a Christian as well. Paul felt free to remain in Corinth for a year and a half, establishing a church. Uh, and we see in Acts 18:18, 18, 18, and he set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. So Priscilla and Aquila, who had left Rome, were in Corinth. He took with him to Ephesus. He left them there, but he himself went to the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. And he said, I'll return to you if God wills. And he sets sail from Ephesus, which brings us to tomorrow, where we will begin the third missionary journey. And we've gotten the whole way through, I think, three letters so far. So we have a lot of uh, letters to cover tomorrow. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father and God, we come before you thanking you for this evening. And we thank you for these brothers and sisters that are a light in a dark world, as are we all. Father, give them faith and give them courage as they go out into the world, knowing that there are those of your children that don't know they're their children, that you're, they're your children, and that they may be the ones that spread that word. Guys, through the evening and our day tomorrow, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Going to make a quick announcement here that I forgot to make at the beginning this evening. I apologize for that and ask your forgiveness. Uh, tomorrow evening, our intentions are to have a closing program at 8.15.